Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. We're shooting today in Italy, in Fiesole, a town in the hills just above Florence. An academic and author, David Berlinski is a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture and a contributing editor at Inference, International Review of Science. Dr. Berlinski holds a doctorate in philosophy from Princeton, performed postdoctoral work in molecular biology at Columbia, and has taught philosophy, mathematics, and English at institutions such as Stanford, Rutgers, and the City University of New York, and the Université de Paris. His books include The Devil's Delusion, Atheism and Its Scientific Pretensions, and The Deniable Darwin and Other Essays. David Berlinski, welcome. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I have to speak for just a moment about David Galerter, the Yale computer scientist who just this past spring published an essay in the Claremont Review of Books called Giving Up Darwin. Quotation, there's no reason to doubt that Darwin successfully explained the small adjustments by which an organism adapts to local circumstances, changes to fur density or wing style or beak shape. Yet, there are many reasons to doubt whether he can explain the big picture, not the fine tuning of species, but the emergence of new ones. The origin of species is exactly what Darwin cannot explain." Close quote. Now, David Galerter is a leading computer scientist, and computer science is at the very center of everything that's cool about the new economy, about the current academia. It's technocratic. It's rational. You don't have to ask ultimate questions. And here's Galerter going over to the kooky side. And why does he do this? In part by reading the work of David Berlinski, which David Galerner, in his essay, referred to as, quote, essential. So take me through a few of your arguments from the deniable Darwin, bearing in mind that you have a lot to answer for. A lot to answer for. Look, since Darwin published in 1859, everyone has pretty much recognized what the problem is. The problem is at the end of the inference, we have something we cannot properly describe, a living system. How on earth are we to place our confidence in a process of evolution if we can't characterize what it reaches? That's an essential problem, not only for a dynamic theory of life, but any learning theory, for example. If you can't characterize what an organism has learned, you don't know how to evaluate a learning theory. By the same token, what we do know of living systems is uh, a degree of complexity that's almost unfathomable. It's complexity wrapped up in complexity, wrapped up in complexity, forming an endless panorama of la labyrinths. And we simply have no way of reconciling the kind of primitive mechanism we see in local variation, random mutation, and natural Which Darwin selection. did describe correctly. Which he he described was on to something there. Sort of something. He had a local okay. theory of change. Right. But he had nothing like a global theory. And this is what we're lacking. All right. Let me ask you, if I may, David. I've made notes. I read sure. that master essay, The Deniable Darwin. And I just made notes. I'm a layman. You're a scientist. I'm going to ask you to make me understand the fossil record. This is you writing in the deniable Darwin. Quote, if life progressed by an accumulation of small changes, as Darwin suggests, the fossil record should reflect this. Little organisms, slightly more complicated, slightly more complicated than that, in a, in a smooth progression to, to David Berlinski and me, say, or at least to dinosaurs. But before the Cambrian era, a brief 600 million years ago, very little is inscribed in the fossil record. And then, during the so-called Cambrian explosion, an astonishing number of biological structures come into creation all at once. The Cambrian era, as I recall, lasted 70 million years. Some uncertainty about the time. It could be more, it could be less. But the argument is that in geologic time, it's a that's, blink of, that's blink the of blink of an, an eye. eye. A blink of an eye. And that's, that's not only a problem for Darwin, that's 
in and of itself fatal? How, how it's not fatal. There are a variety of explanations in the literature. I mean, some, some paleontologists argue that the record is there. It's just not very evident. Others argue that there was a large-scale radiation, and uh, much of the details are now lost, but there's no reason to doubt that that occurred. But the essential part is, look, you've got a theory that makes at least one qualitative prediction. That is, change in biology is continuous. It's not radical. It's not discontinuous. It doesn't jump. And if you look at the historical record, it seems to jump all over the place, especially at the Cambrian. Now, whether there are explanations, whether that can be reconciled, the historical record is an open question. But for heaven's sake, let's begin with the obvious. There's something not right in the theory. It makes a qualitative prediction on the one hand, and the facts are recalcitrant on the other. Maybe you can reconcile the two. I don't have an opinion. I'm not a paleontologist. But the least that we should be doing is saying clearly, look, something's not right. Something isn't right. And it's not only the Cambrian explosion. Look at us sitting around the room doing something that no other organism can do, chatting with one another. Now, what is, it? What is the explanation for a whole suite of human powers and capacities, language foremost among them? Well, the usual Darwinian explanation, the usual explanation of common sense is, look, it's tremendously useful. Right, right, Tremend right. OK, if it's so useful, why is it so isolated? No other organism can speak. Try talking to the dog. See how far it gets you. They have nothing to say. Nor do the cats. Perhaps that's, that's incorrect. They don't wish to say anything. <laughs> the cats don't deign to speak to us. Yeah. Right? But uh, that's a typical example. We have a, a property that's absolutely self-evident. The power to assimilate a natural language. No other organism has that power. We don't know why we're the only species so gifted. So is part of your, I want to return to the deniable Darwin in a moment, but part of, the, uh, part of your argument, I'm not even sure it's an argument as much as irritation. Is Probably the, better. <laughs> lack of humility within the field. You say, look, here's what you'd expect from Darwin, continuous change. Here's the fossil record. They don't match up. Maybe there are explanations, but for goodness sake, have the humility to say there's a, there's, there's, there's a problem. And the field doesn't say that. Well, I should probably be the last person on earth offering the counsel of humility to my <laughs> academic <laughs> colleagues. But I'll do it anyway. Yeah, that would be a good beginning. Let's, why don't we go back to 1859 and say, here's a theory that has certain kinds of properties. And then skip forward to the present day and say, look, the theory has many interesting things. Fidelity the, to the facts doesn't seem to be among them. It's an interesting theory. It's no gross default in a theory that it's not faithful to the facts. But it's not a good sign either. Uh, that, that includes all the discussions about gaps in the fossil record. You know, when you come to species, there are not many that form a continuous progression. Uh, higher order, you have large groupings that do form continuous progressions. But species, there are very few on the ground, as, as Gould uh, recognized very Stephen clearly. Stephen Jay Gould. Stephen Jay Gould recognized very clearly. Right. You can't just say the theory is correct and its infidelity to the facts is absolutely of no interest. It's very interesting. We don't have a continuous record. Maybe there's a good reason. Maybe there's a good reason, but maybe there's not. All right. I sometimes think there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an urge to adapt the Bertolt, Bertolt Brecht. We have a government, let's change, elect a new people, change, and change the, people. the facts, change the facts. Right. So here's, a, back to the deniable Darwin quote. I'm quoting you, David. The general issue is one of size and space and the way in which something small may be found amidst something very big. This is the math of evolution. Can you explain that to me? You cite, you cite an example of Richard Dawkins, who is the uh, pro zoologist, I believe. And Dawkins says, monkeys typing at typewriters, sooner or later they will type the phrase, and he chooses a phrase from, church, uh, from uh, Shakespeare, methinks it is a weasel. And then you write, methinks it is a weasel, 
is a six-word sentence containing 28 English letters, including the spaces. It occupies an isolated point in a space of 10,000 million, 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 million possibilities. Any definition of natural selection must plainly meet what I have called a rule against deferred success. All right, so this gets to the mathematics of random variation acted on under natural selection. Are there enough variations? Do we have time for, do we, are there enough life forms mutating? Is there time? Has there been time since Big Bang? I suppose I'm fumbling here, but help me to think about the mathematics. Everybody's fumbling. The mathematics isn't very complicated, I assure you. It's the implications that are rebarbative. You take any combinatorial string, look at a protein, it consists of 20 am amino acids. Right. And you can jumble them up or permute them in a lot of different ways. And they Huge numbers of ways. grow in surprising speed, with a surprising speed. If you have a, a string of uh, amino acids, 250 amino acids in length, that means you've got 20 to the 250th power as your total space of possibilities. Now, finding anything in this space is just impossible. You don't have time, you don't have the resources. The space is too overwhelming. What you cannot do in Darwinian theory is say, I know what I'm looking for. It happens to be a needle. This is a haystack. I know what a needle looks like, and I can go find it. Yeah, you can do that. There's no problem about that. But Darwinian evolution is blind to the future. All success is local at a particular moment in a particular space and time. If so, how is some complicated protein ever found? Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute the problem is negatively overwhelming, but it is a problem, exactly like the Cambrian explosion is a problem. This is a problem, too. It's called combinatorial explosion. It's called combinatorial explosion because I coined it thus many years ago. The space becomes huge. But exactly the same thing is true in a natural language if you take a Oh, I don't know, a high school graduate is supposed to know something like 20,000 words. Is that about right? Maybe half that many. I don't know. Uh, you and I know many more, of course. Thank you, Dave. And uh, you take a simple sentence. John brought the book back home. And you consider all the different ways different nouns and verbs could slot into that and all the different ways they could be permuted. How'd you ever find that sentence? It is much worse than finding a needle in a haystack. You found something because you knew what you were looking for. And you knew what you were looking for because you had a thought. How that thought translates into a grammatical sentence, no one knows. But you did it. If you did it by looking ahead, it's very reasonable to suggest, it's not an argument, but it's reasonable to suggest, life must have some forward-looking capacity to construct the fiercely complicated structures that we see everywhere, like the human eye, right. like the kidney. Right, right. Okay, so, so properly understood, Darwin is interesting, but the gap between this very elegant, or at least quite simple, everybody can grasp what Darwin is up to, the gap between that and what we actually see and what we have come to understand the gap is mathematics, Cambrian explosion, and so forth, should instill a greater sense of wonder at what we don't know, instead of a rather smug self-confidence that we've got the problem licked. I think that the, the opinion among evolutionary biologists is not necessarily we have the problem licked, but we have the foundations laid and everything is Everything else is a matter of embroidering on right. those foundations. I think that's quite mistaken. I see. I don't think the foundations are well laid. All right. Design. You quote the 18th century English theologian William Paley, who argued that no one could bring himself to believe that a watch was assembled at random, much less all of creation. I'm quoting you, the deniable Darwin. It is simply a fact that this courtly and old-fashioned argument is entirely compelling. We, we human beings, we never attribute the existence of a complex artifact to chance." 
close quote. Or, if I may paraphrase that great philosopher William Jefferson Clinton, if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know it didn't get there by itself. Probably not. OK. So again, why is this, is, this is dangerous territory. Dangerous, yeah, it is dangerous territory, culturally dangerous territory anyway. Because what you're saying is life needs some forward-looking capacity to be able to find the, those extremely complicated proteins that are, something is going on there that isn't purely random. And anybody who sees David Berlinski take a, even a half step in that direction says, stop. If he takes another two steps, we'll be back to God, the medieval period, and the Inquisition. Stop him now. Yeah, I suppose so, although I look with unconcern at those consequences. Um, I think they're neither here nor there. We should, we should have the confidence to follow a scientific theory wherever it leads. And if it leads back to the uh, medieval period, if it leads back to the 13th century, and if it leads finally to the Inquisition, I'm prepared so long as I'm among the inquisitors. <laughs> But other than that, I think these are misguided criticisms. I don't think the chasm is going to yawn if we say, look, we really don't understand this. I don't think anything bad will happen. All right. Well, let me push back on that. There's an essay, an essay that appeared recently in National Review by a biologist called Razib Khan, whose yeah, name I've read who, it, yeah. you've read that. All right, you've, you're familiar with that. So let me try a little bit of this sure. on you. Razib Khan, I apologize to him if I'm mispronouncing his name. Quote, Evolutionary biology is nothing for conservatives to fear because it is one of the crowning achievements of modern Western civilization. One of the crowning achievements of Western civilization. The science built upon the rock of Charles Darwin's ideas is a reflection of Western modernity's commitment to truth as a fundamental value." Close quote. Charles Darwin was a champion of truth and David Berlinski is an obscurantist. I guess. Um, the rhetoric alone should give you a little twinge of doubt. The crowning achievement of Western civilization? Eh, I don't know. Maxwell's theory of the electromagnetic field, for sure. Darwin publishing at the same time. An interesting view, not his uniquely, I and mean, Alfred Wallace had the same idea. Right. But Alfred Wallace was very significantly, significantly cognizant of the limitations of those theories. Darwin was not. Its influence, let, let's put it this way, I wouldn't call it a crowning achievement of Western civilization because I think the theory is fundamentally deficient, but it certainly had an enormous social influence. It's changed a whole way of thinking whether to, for the good or the bad, these are other questions. Again, Razib Khan, today many on the left reject the very idea of human nature. They assert that society and values can be restructured at will. You're talking about the social implications of Darwin, so yeah. is he. That male and female are categories of the mind rather than of nature. In rejecting evolution, That's me. a conservative gives up the most powerful rejoinder to these claims. Men are men, and women are women, and if you let go of Darwin, you lose your ability to make that claim. It's an interesting example of a complete non sequitur. I don't see how a, a rational critique of Darwin impedes in any way the desire to uphold the concept of human nature, not only a concept of human nature, but essential human nature. There is something essential about the binary divisions in human life between male and female. It's not accidental. It can be changed. Uh, and deep down, we all know that. But that has nothing to do with Darwin. How do, you, how do you reach the contrary conclusion by reading The Origin of Species? Darwin himself got rid of any essential ideas in biology. Uh, from a strictly philosophical point of view, he's a nominalist. There are no such things as species, abstract entities. They're a progression of individuals receding into the past. There's no point in which one can say, this is a species, unless you're a group of isolated individuals. And there are problems about that, too, because that seems to embrace a species within the folds of set theory. 
So, I mean, if you take a look at the dogs, are all dogs, if, if you think that all dogs form one species, mm -hmm. can you say where the species begin and where, you, know, you can't say anything like that at all. So the idea of reconciling species to a modern point of view in set theory is hopeless. Well, if they're not sets, what are they? If dogs don't form a set of objects, what are they? Uh, either they're nothing, which is Darwin's real position, or there's some abstract thing. Why is that Darwin's real position? Because he has no way of defining the notion of a species. There's nothing essential, because everything is mutable. It changes all the time. And he didn't, he didn't see that himself. The book is called On the Origin of Species. It is, and that's an irony. But consider it from a Darwinian point of view. An organism changes, and if the changes accumulate, the whole structure, the species structure changes. But there's no point where you can say, that's a species, everything before is one species, everything after is another species. Is there a primordial dog such that its birth marks the beginning of the dogs, and everything before that, them's just the wolves? No, there is no such thing. It's a gradual transition. I see. I see. Okay, so you're, I hadn't, every time I talk to you, David, there's a new idea that more or less lifts the, my, the top of my head off. Uh, I'll have to, got it, got it, I'll try to, all right, back to, you're throwing me off here, David. Sorry. Back to, to Razib Khan. One last excerpt from his recent yeah. article in National Review. Quote, looking forward, the energies of the right are not most fruitfully spent on debating dissent with modification and common origin of life. You're wasting your time. The seeds of both tyranny and democracy were sown by the evolutionary pressures that shaped humans over millions of years. We should not pass up knowledge and insights that might help in preserving what we think is good, beautiful, and true." Close quote. It'd be awfully hard to disagree with that, except for the first part about the seeds of something being sown in evolutionary time. I don't see a whole lot of seeds being sown in the struggle for life and primordial Africa, uh, certainly not seeds that have anything to do with modern life. That's just one of the contemporary myths that's bandied about where evolutionary, uh, evolutionary psychologists and sociologists keep talking about the deep aspects of our nature that were formed by evolutionary pressures. I think most deep aspects of our nature were not formed by evolutionary pressures. Um, but that, that's a separate argument. But the, the succeeding part of that quotation uh, yeah, sure, we can judge things by standards of truth, goodness, and beauty. Nobody's stopping us. All right. Uh, David, you recently, in, in, in Inference, the International Review of Science, which you helped to edit, you published a review of something that somebody worked very hard at, and was, it was a clear effort to achieve something good. And that object was a book called Blueprint, and it is a book by the Yale sociologist and physician, Nicholas Christakis, whose name I may be mispronouncing, but I tried hard to get it right. Nicholas Christakis, and the name, the name of the book is Blueprint. And Christakis says, we live at a difficult moment. Europe is in turmoil, more turmoil coming, immigration pressures, rise of China, tensions between China and the United States, and it is in the air that uh, we are predisposed toward violence and disorder because of evolutionary pressures. But let me, Nicholas Christakis, produce a book showing the way that we are predisposed to cooperate, to form groups, to work for the good as well by evolution. The book runs to more than 500 pages, but the argument in brief, and I quote it from Blueprint, Natural selection has shaped our lives as social animals. You should be happy about this. Priming our capacity for love, friendship, cooperation, learning, and even our ability to recognize the uniqueness of other individuals. All this from natural selection. We each carry within us an evolutionary blueprint for making a good society. Close quote. And I have to tell you that the tenor of your review is one in which you are just not impressed. Why is that? Well, divide through those statements by natural selection, you're left with rather an optimistic credo. We are, by and large, disposed to certain worthwhile ends, and we have the means to pursue them. Yeah, that's true, sometimes. 
Uh, the negation is just as true if you look at the 20th century, and all the virtues that he expresses, for example, cooperation, uh, can be put to very nefarious uses. Look, the Nazi party was a marvelous engine of cooperation. All those Nazis cooperated with one another running death camps. Cooperation is relatively neutral. The gulag couldn't have been uh, maintained without, without cooperation either. Uh, China couldn't be maintained uh, under, under Mao in the 60, 50s and 60s without large-scale cooperation. Uh, this hasn't passed the level of the uh, bromide, something one swallows and expects some uh, relief for heartburn. The heartburn goes far too deep for this kind of analysis, the heartburn of the 20th century. And I'm not talking about indigestion either. I'm talking about heartburn. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have very little by way of understanding what happened in the 20th century. Look, we're talking about 220 million excess deaths between 1914 and 1945. That's not something that can be relieved by calling to mind our powers of cooperation. If anything, there was far too much cooperation during those years. Very little love, far too much cooperation. So these, these offer little by way either of analysis, penetrating analysis of the sort, for example, that Hannah Arendt provided. Mm -hmm. um, or the, Hannah, or, Hannah Arendt and the banality of evil and, well, well, uh, and the sources of totalitarianism. All of her books, at right. least she recognized the magnitude of uh, the question that needed to be answered which was why after the relatively optimistic 19th century was there a descent into barbarism in the 20th century? We don't know. And Charles Darwin doesn't help us answer it. Doesn't help much. By the way, the technique of argument in Blueprint, you write this. The argument, that is Christakis' argument in Blueprint, the argument is unvarying and proceeds from the common feature of social life to the gene acting as its presumptive cause yet we can complete no connection between any particular gene and any phenotypic trait. It's true, isn't it? Right. By a connection, I mean a complete causal connection. And it is remote in time, the time at which we we're able to complete a chemical or a biochemical connection. We have no idea what takes place. I mean, you learn to walk, I learn to walk. You can say there's a gene for walking because we didn't learn it, but that doesn't tell you any more than that you learned to walk. David, in your review of Blueprint, the book by Christiakis, you sum up your own view by writing this. If the blueprint for our social behavior circumscribes the terrible societies of the 20th century, it's too broad to be of interest. And if it is determined by the human genome, it's too narrow to be of hope. We must look to other sources for our common humanity. Which led me to wonder, what would David make of a certain document that I find compelling but difficult? And that is the address on the relation between faith and reason of then Pope Benedict the 16th at 2006 at his old University of Regensburg, Germany. And I have no idea. I'm doing this because we're friends and because I genuinely want to hear what you have to make of this, what you make of this. So, uh, and I may have to read a couple of longish passages to set it up. The Pope sets up the problem. Here's the problem, part one. Western thought has reached a point at which, quote, only the kind of certainty resulting from the interplay of mathematical and empirical elements can be considered scientific. By its very nature, this method, that is the scientific method as currently understood in the West, by its very nature, this method excludes the question of God, making, it, uh, making that question appear unscientific or pre-scientific, close quote. And you come out of your chair and say, of course it excludes the question of God. God has nothing to do with science. Or is that not quite your response? Maybe it should be. Um, what I do think is that uh, if you look at the great theories in physics, that's really where the richest tradition lies that has some relevance to the world as it is, as opposed to mathematics. Physi not physics explaining observed 
reality, the well, richness physics, of reality. Well, physics explaining the world, let's right. put it that way. Right. Mathematics explains plenty of things. But I think that should be put aside as a separate case for the time being. But neither the assumptions nor the conclusions of any of the great four physical theories, Newtonian mechanics, Einstein relativity, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, make any claims about the existence of God. They just don't they mention just leave it. it out. Just leave it out. That's either a good thing or a bad thing, but the fact is incontrovertible. These are not theological documents. Fine, treat them for what they are. They're physical theories. But don't argue, as so many people do, that their implicit conclusion is anti-theistic. It's not. There's no conclusion you can draw from special relativity that would indicate God does not exist, or that he does. All right. OK, F fair enough. And I'm, I'm even following you, I believe. Um, the problem part two, the pressure on Europe from the Islamic world. Again, I'm quoting Benedict XVI. The world's profoundly religious cultures see the exclusion of the divine from the universality of reason, that is, we can talk about anything but not God, as an attack on their most profound convictions, a reason which is deaf to the divine and which relegates religion to the realm of subcultures. That's what you were saying, what you were describing, this notion of, of physics as disproving God or in one way or another condescending to the religious that relegates religion to the realm of subcultures is incapable of entering into the dialogue of cultures." Close quote. We have a problem. We Westerners have shoved any notion of religious thought, any sense of the transcendent, off to the children's table. And other cultures, and in particular Islam, from which the West is under pressure, uh, Aside from anything else, just look at the population figures. The population of Europe over the next half century will decline. The population of the Islamic world will grow by some hundreds of millions. That's, that's a problem. And we can't talk to them, let alone sorting out some kind of working. We can't talk to them because they take religion seriously. You admit that he's framed a real problem? Admit, at grant, you'd agree. How would you see the problem? You're not, so you're I not impressed. I wouldn't express the problem in the way that he did. I think we're perfectly capable of discussing things with Islam. Uh, we're less capable of entertaining a whole category of arguments that we used to entertain with considerable interest, that is, theological arguments. Right. And theology has more or less disappeared as part of the Western curriculum, part of the Western habit of thought. But it has not completely disappeared. Look. Why has it dis stopped there? Why has it disappeared? And you're, you're talking about what, over a century and a half, two centuries? What are you talking about? Since the French Revolution? years, maybe since the French Revolution. All right. Because of the, uh, first of all, there, there are two parts to the disappearance. The enormous success of a secular culture very obviously breeds an expectation that its fundamental assumptions must be correct if it produced so much material abundance, so much relative absence of scarcity. And the second part is um, the great difficulty of entertaining very abstract arguments about the existence and providence of God in the world as it is without the apparatus of modern science to buttress those arguments. That is, we feel a distinct inadequacy in making any claims about the real world without having an enormous apparatus, like a backpack, uh, saying, I'll look in the backpack and special relativity tells me that the ontological proof is correct. Well, no, it's not going to tell you that. You have to address it on its own and naked. And that's something very few people want to do anymore. Uh, it is temporary. It's just a fashion. Theological arguments are not going to disappear, and the fundamental questions they address are not going to disappear either. You see certain signs in the wind. For example, the ontological argument in philosophy, which has been current since the 12th, in fact, the late 11th century, uh, has not disappeared. And the greatest logician of the 20th century, Kurt Gödel, made it manifest in his own way. He didn't. Oh, so explain that. The girdle, the girdle insufficient, what is it called? The, 
I've never understood it. Uh, Anselm argued in the 11th, 12th century that God is a being greater than which none other can be conceived. And he concluded, therefore, he must, he must exist. Well, why? Because if he didn't exist, you could conceive something still greater, namely a being who did exist. Oh, well, everybody said, you know, I couldn't be right. Bertrand Russell said, oh, my God, what was he? The trouble is it's very hard to refute. It's, very, it's devilishly difficult to really come up with a convincing explanation of where he went wrong. And in the 1960s, Kurt Gödel worked it all out in terms of modal logic. And he, he, I don't think he published his results. He showed his results to Dana Scott, among others. And it's provoked an enduring controversy ever since then. An indication in a small subfield that these issues retain an intellectual vitality denied them by mainstream science. Does this mean the argument is correct? I have no idea. You have no idea, but it's all right. But the argument from design is also making a reappearance. It's also making a reappearance, inconclusively, granted. But it hasn't gone away, and it won't go away because we're too impressed by the facts to avoid an encounter with any theory that so seems to explain them. That's that action. So Newton, Einstein, Max Planck, the physical theories they come up with, you don't find something, you don't have the feeling that there's something else trying to push, push into it. But when you discuss, as you have just discussed, evolution, and you say, wait a minute, what could possibly account for the complexity of life? Wait a minute. Even grant that, these, that life proceeds by way of, of mutation, it doesn't look as though it can be entirely random. It looks as though it knows where it wants to go. You feel as though, just on the other side of the wall, there must be something there that's sure. intelligent, that's, there's, a be, there's something there. You don't feel that in physics, do you? And that argument from design is, look at this. It must mean something. You hear a murmur no matter what you study. you study. Oh, you do? No, I think so. You look at physics long enough and the murmur becomes quite insistent. Why are the laws of nature the way they are? Why are the constants, the parameters fixed for the values that they happen to have? These may be bad questions. They may be good questions. They may be unanswerable or undecidable questions, but they are questions. They are questions and um, the insistent murmur is heard whenever you push a discipline to a certain degree and with a certain effort of the will. So that wasn't Einstein. Einstein's comments, we have a few comments in which he mentions God. There's certain theories of which he disapproves, disapproves because God wouldn't play dice with the universe. The old one doesn't throw dice. The Der old Alta. one doesn't throw dice, the Alta. But that, he wasn't just being coy, he felt, he felt it you know, no, Einstein was know. given over to expressing a lot of uh, apothems, pithy thoughts. All right. We shouldn't make much he, of it. His comments about God not playing dice were really a response to his discomfort with quantum theory. All right. Uh, but it was a fundamental attitude toward the universe as well because Einstein believed in the rationality, the comprehensibility of the universe. Okay. Stop there because now let me get you back to Benedict. You just said the rationality of the universe. And Benedict, in this speech at Regensburg, he quotes a medieval Byzantine emperor who is, and there's a dialogue, we have a dialogue between the Byzantine emperor and his Islamic captors. He'd been captured. And the Islam, Manuel II, it doesn't matter who he is, but he, he makes the argument, you must not attempt to convert by violence, by conquest, because that's an act against reason. And unreason offends against the nature of God, which is reasonable. And then the Pope, and that's in 1400 and something or others, I recall. And here's what, the, what Benedict the 16th says in 2006. Is the conviction that acting unreasonably contradicts God's nature merely a Greek idea, something that occurred in Byzantine culture? Or is it always and intrinsically true? And then he gives a little exegesis, modifying the first book of Genesis, the first verse of the whole Bible, John, Gospel John, begins the prologue of his gospel with the words, in the beginning was the logos. 
And logos, of course, means reason and word. It's the very mm -hmm. idea that the Greeks, Hellenistic thought places at the center of its conception of reason. Uh, John thus spoke the final word on the biblical concept of God, and in his word, all the often toilsome and torturous threads of biblical faith find their culmination and synthesis. So in the distinctively Western Judeo-Christian tradition, I suppose one thing I'm asking is whether that tradition still lives, still informs us, still should inform us. There is no necessary contradiction between faith and reason. When Richard Dawkins, the zoologist, says, Darwin makes it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist, he's talking nonsense. I, ah, I this guess. is not easy for you. You don't like this. You don't like this line of thought. Well, look, intellectually fulfilled atheist. I mean, how full should an intellectually fulfilled atheist really be? Must he have <laughs> answers to all the questions that human beings have asked since time immemorial? Or is it sufficient that he just dismisses a great many questions and reposes in tranquility thereafter? I think Dawkins really means the latter. It gives us freedom to ignore a lot of questions. And I suppose that's true. It's true empirically. Uh, but the questions return, return. The murmur is always heard if you listen carefully enough. Uh, the interesting question is whether, the interesting question theologically, is whether rationality is an essential attribute of the deity. And bear in mind, the Islamic tradition says no. Right. No. Yes. And that is a deep, a profound difference. You only have to, to talk to a Muslim theologian for five minutes to realize how deep that runs. God is limited by nothing, including the powers of reason. And this drove a great many medieval Muslim theologians mad. Al-Ghazali, for example, he couldn't reconcile that view of the deity with anything to which he was committed in virtue of his training in Greek logic, for example. So he simply stopped talking and stopped writing. As his physician said very memorably, God put a lock on his tongue. And that's the only way he could reconcile these quite different impulses. Let me finish up Benedict and, and Regensburg. I'm having a lovely time just tossing these things at you and seeing what you do with them. This is the Pope. He's summing up here. The, this attempt, meaning his argument, painted with broad strokes at a critique of modern reason, strictly empirical scientific method, from within, has nothing to do with putting the clock back to the time before the Enlightenment and rejecting the insights of the modern age. Yet while we, we rejoice in the new possibilities, science has opened. The material, uh, the material wealth we all, the, the, the sheer success of empirical science in producing new wealth for society, right? We all rejoice in that. We also see dangers, and we must ask ourselves how we can overcome them. The enemy of modern life, the all right. We will succeed in doing so only if reason and faith can come together in a new way. Does David Berlinski buy this? In this sense, theology rightly belongs within the wide-ranging dialogue of the sciences, precisely as theology as an inquiry into the rationality of faith. Only thus do we become capable of genuine dialogue of cultures and religions so urgently needed today. Faith and reason, not only is there no necessary contradiction, but we ought to recognize and in some way celebrate and in some way make use of the way in which the tradition we have inherited, the Judeo-Christian tradition, sees them as linked. Well, you know, <laughs> you've got a synthesis well. between two imponderables. I really don't know what, what commitment is made when I, I say or somebody else says, I have faith. I have faith in a great many things. I use that locution, for example, I have faith that tomorrow morning the sun will rise, uh, or faith that yesterday the sun did rise. Um, I believe in reason to the extent that I understand what people are talking about when they, you know, I believe in logic, let's put it that way. 
I know what a good argument is, what a bad argument, what soundness is, what validity is. Beyond that, reason seems to have very little meaning for me. So a reconciliation between two imponderables seems to me like uh, the meanest sort of kisses sold under famine conditions. Yeah, that's what they are. The reconciliation is what it is, but it doesn't really mean anything. One thing I'm reasonably certain of is that theology as a discipline is not going to undergo a resurrection anytime soon. It's not. No, because I don't believe it's just not interesting enough. Why, why would that be? There's a tremendous, um, tre tremendous buffeting that uh, ideas undergo. And the closest we can come to explaining them is to say that uh, they're buffeted by taste, by, by changes in what we consider important. I mean, everybody who dismisses theology as a moribund science, for example, Richard Dawkins, you can be sure they're not studying it. They just know the outlines devoted to an examination of the property. It couldn't be, any, it couldn't be anything that occupies an evol evolutionary biologist, and that's true. It's not anything that occupies an evolutionary biologist. Without uh, a dedicated audience, the subject will perish, and that's what's happened over the last 200 years. It still exists in terms of Catholic hermeneutics. It exists in terms of different, uh, different varieties of Catholic, Jewish, or Islamic doctrine, but it's not at the mainstream, and it's not going to move to the mainstream, and that's just a fact we have to accept. Last questions. Europe, you've lived here for a couple of decades now below replacement level birth rates, economic stagnation relative to the United States, relative to China, certainly. Uh, uncertainty about the continued role or even over the long-term existence of the historic nation states. And under immense pressure from Africa, uh, population of Europe flat, declining. Population of Africa is expected to double by yeah. 2050. Two generations from now, it will have doubled and Europe will have begun a hollowing out. On the one hand, you've got Emmanuel Macron, President of France, Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany, who insist on a thoroughly secular Europe. On the other hand, one last time, Benedict XVI, uh, this convergence of biblical faith and Greek philosophy with the subsequent addition of the Roman heritage created Europe and remains the foundation of what rightly can be called Europe. Close quote. How does Europe survive? Must there be some kind of conscious return to the Judeo-Christian tradition? Are the secularists laicite in France? Is that the way to go? What, what? I certainly try not to think in terms of two generations into the future, because it's just too long a period. I can hardly, I hardly make sense of what's going to happen next week. Because the, there's so many surprises. Uh, I never expected the Macron presidency to be jeopardized by the Gilets Jaunes movement, the, the guys with their yellow vests, but it was. Uh, I didn't expect Merkel to have emerged from her welcome in 2015 politically handicapped, but she was. She may have done the right thing morally, she did the wrong thing when politically. You said welcome, she welcomed about a million, about a million. Uh, immigrants into Germany. She welcomed a million. Uh, largely Syrian, I think, immigrants into Germany. And uh, she was warmly applauded by correct opinion everywhere. And I think the moral gesture was reasonable, considering Germany is Germany. Um, unexpected, but reasonable. But politically, it was a fatal, a fatal mistake. She because has never it jeopardized recovered. her power completely. And that's why she's on the way out right now. What very, very often goes unnoticed is that socially, the assimilation of a million refugees seems to have passed relatively successfully. There's a small rate, a rise in the crime rate here and there. But by and large, the anarchy and the chaos that was predicted has not taken place. The Germans seem to be very capable of doing that sort of thing. What the, the role of the nation state is, that remains fraught. The, the fact of the matter is nobody believes in the nation state either. Not it's already it, gone. It's gone. Not in Italy, not in France. They're vestiges of patriotism. Everyone is emotionally You would sympathetic. not include Britain? I would include Britain. You would include Britain? I would include. Uh, the nation state as an idea no longer has an overwhelming hold on man's imagination. So Brexit was a waste of time? 
Brexit was a complicated decision where people just said they were fed up with the British elites and their, their loss of sovereignty to the EU. And they were absolutely right. There was a considerable loss of sovereignty to the EU. And the best proof is that it's so hard to get out of the EU. But whether that is an exaltation of British identity, I really doubt it. The, today's uh, contemporary Britain is incapable, emotionally incapable, of doing what it did in 1940. That is rallying to a superb leader in France. Uh, the idea of France is cultural now. It's a matter of taste, savoir faire, but it's not a matter of tremendous sense of French identity. Nor is the Italian, nor so the Spaniard. 50 years ago, when de Gaulle spoke about la gloire de la France, people somehow or other had some notion what he meant. They don't today. Gone. Gone. In half a century, simply evaporated. It's just French, gone. French sense of self. It can be said unironically today. It cannot be said. Cannot be said without irony. So, so you're an optimist, or you're a pessimist, or you just don't, you're just perfectly content leading one day at a taking it one day at a time in Paris. I think it's foolish to be an optimist or a pessimist. There are plenty of reasons for both. For optimism, the remarkable improvement in the physical circumstances of life throughout Europe, United States, Japan, even China, burgeoning middle class, probably also the Soviet Union, to some extent in Africa, to some extent Latin America is a case apart. Those are all good reasons for optimism, the decline in poverty, improvement in health, very solid reasons for optimism. Uh, but there are also reasons for pessimism. The chief among them is just look back at the 20th century and see what can happen. David, last couple of questions. <clears throat> April 15th, the Cathedral of Notre Dame, consumed in flames. That evening, your daughter Claire, a very fine writer in her own right, by the way, your daughter Claire puts up this post, my father is safe. But he's been evacuated, so he's sleeping on my bed. It's 20 years, he said, look, that I've been looking out on Notre Dame. That building is completely part of my life. And then he fell asleep. The French have announced an international competition to redesign the roof and spire of Notre Dame. French Prime Minister Philippe, the competition will give the building, quote, a spire suited to the techniques and challenges of our time. Close. God forbid. I was going to say, what, what, do you expect, what do you expect yourself to be looking out on for the next 20 years? Some architectural monstrosity, without doubt. I mean, modern architecture is a, a spasm in ugliness almost everywhere that you look. <laughs> and these people's incompetence are exceeded only by their vanity. We all know that. Every time a modern building goes up, everyone wants to spit at it. And if they lose the desire to spit at it, it's only because they've become familiar with it, like the pyramid in front of the Louvre. I don't know whether you've seen any of the proposals for the uh, roof of Notre Dame. One enterprising architect suggested a swimming pool, an Olympic-sized swimming pool, on top of a, an 800-year-old religious structure. It gives you an idea of what they have in mind. All right. Uh, on that point, you're not optimistic. <clears throat> Your parents fled Europe for the United States. You moved back. I checked the population statistics. France has a population of about half a million Jews and a population of between five and six million Muslims. Do you feel safe? Completely so. No problem. Me personally? Yes, you? No, I've been dating a Muslim woman for 20 years. I'm protected. I've got an affidavit so, right here. So, so you're telling me, calm down, this notion. I've been trying to say that Europe is under pressure. Of all kinds, and one thing we read in the United States often is that Jewish populations in France, particularly, are under pressure. There are places you don't feel uh, safe on the street. One doesn't feel safe on the street. And so and you're saying relax. Places. There are. Yeah. I mean, uh, look, there are, are higher crime neighborhoods and lower crime neighborhoods. I can tell you, as far as I'm concerned, as far as Claire is concerned, we don't feel under pressure from anti-Semitism. Although we know perfectly well where the anti-Semitism comes from. I mean, there's a great deal of Islamic anti-Semitism, but it's fragile. It's very thin. It's not anything like historical anti-Semitism. Right. It's the narcissism of small differences, because anyone who knows the Muslim community, especially the Muslim family, knows they're mirror images of the Jewish community. They really are. Right. Very close. All right. 
a last passage. This is the last question. Last passage from your essay, The Deniable Darwin. And you're discussing the second law. <clears throat> this, is, this was fascinating. I've not seen this anywhere else in the writing about Darwin, pro, for or against. The second law of thermodynamics, which of course holds that any, in any system, entropy will tend to increase, never decrease. Entropy meaning disorder, disorder. just disorder, right? So this is what you write quite. Life, life appears to offer at least a temporary rebuke to the second law of thermodynamics. If the complexity of living creatures is increasing, the entropy that surrounds them is decreasing. I thought to myself, I had never thought of that as a definition of life, but of course, we inhale air, we consume food, and look, we're ordered creatures. Whatever the universe as a whole may be doing, and I'm old enough to have been taught that the universe is running down like a clock, biologically, things have gone from bad to better. How so, you continue? God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let fowl fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. That is how so. And who, on the basis of experience, would be inclined to disagree? Close quote. Now, David, it's been a long time since you and I addressed this question, but are you still passing yourself off as an agnostic? Night and day. Night and day, all right. I'm not going to, you are cutting no ice for me on that one whatsoever. Look. There's a, there's a crucial difference to be made. A man, man says, I believe that God does not exist, which Dawkins or Sam Harris or Christopher Hitchens, that's an affirmation. He's making a commitment to a certain kind of creedal system. I believe that. And just as I believe there's no natural number between four and five. I think I can show that very easily. A man who says, I don't believe that God exists has no skin in the game. He's just saying that among his beliefs are not one that could be expressed as God exists. It doesn't mean he believes the contrary. It means he has not reached that state of equipoise where he can say, God exists. I believe that God exists. He's withdrawing his belief. And that is something that is incontestable. You can't argue against a man who says, I just don't believe it. It doesn't mean he, he needs persuasion or he needs proof that in, in the economy of his belief system, you won't find a particular belief. Uh, I think before one crosses the threshold of theological commitment, one has to be put together in a certain way. Uh, Pascal said very memorably, every human being has a hole in his heart that's shaped like God. Well, maybe. But in some men, the hole is a whole lot smaller than others. Uh, I don't say this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I am mindful of the smallness in diameter of the hole I possess, and there's just nothing I wish to change about that. That's the way it is. Fair enough. David Berlinski, author of many works, including The Deniable Darwin and Other Essays, and editor of Inference, the International Journal of Science, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. For Uncommon Knowledge, the Hoover Institution and Fox Nation, I'm Peter Robinson. Mm -hmm.